propagation. I would argue there's a chicken egg problem. And an equally important reason why above 50 gigahertz isn't being used is in all of Europe, it's illegal to use it. And people do not develop products that are illegal to use. That's the reason why 50 gigahertz isn't used. I mean, it has to do with the physics too, but the fact that off common and European counterparts forbid use of above 50 gigahertz is a damn good reason for why people don't develop products. Okay. Let me start off with this question. Here I put a bunch of American companies up there. Why are all these companies American? None of them are British, none of them are European. Why? You know, these are good questions I think to ask sometimes. I will focus on two of these companies, and one of which is an exhibitor downstairs, by the way, I've never heard of them. Um, if you want to talk about other ones over a, a beer, I would be glad to discuss them with you. But let's talk about, focus on why these two companies are British. And first I'll go into the macroeconomics spectrum, then the two companies, and then the GDP implications of these things. Even though I'm a card carrying engineer, uh, I like to talk about economics too. Um, telecom is a big industry in its own right. There, in the U.S., the telecom industry is several hundred billion dollar industry in terms of gross sales when you throw in broadcasting, mobile, and fixed. Telecom, though, is also a basic commodity in today's economy. It's what keeps the modern economy moving, and the cost and efficiency of the telecom in industry can enhance or decrease the whole productivity of a country. We are all involved in global competition with other parts of the world. Europeans and Americans are not going to beat the Asians for per, per hour production cost, but we can compete in the world economy by keeping our productivity high, and telecom is a key factor for that. New, also, new information in telecom services can enable whole new industries. You know, I got annoyed I was in an EC discussion about their research program at Ultra Wideband, where they focused on how many Ultra Wideband chips might be made five years, ten years from now. And I told them, that's the wrong question. It's not how many Ultra Wideband chips. It's how many new services can be enabled and what that will do to economic growth. It's not that the semiconductor industry is end unto itself. Telecommunications, when done right, permeates through the whole economy and the efficiencies permeate through the whole economy in generating new services and in, in industries. That's why I had Land's End up there, which is a clothing company. It isn't a telecom industry, but it was enabled by telecom because if we didn't have efficient toll-free telephone numbers and then internet, you once been able to start efficient uh, mail or clothing companies. And Land's End has 5,000 employees in its home state of Wisconsin. Now, in the UK, are there any other industries that are, that are 20 or 30 years old that have that many employees in rural areas? Okay. Unfortunately, spectrum management in most countries is the closest thing to Soviet economic planning outside of Belarus and maybe North Korea. What spectrum managers traditionally do is try to predict the growth of technology, the growth of demand, and like the old people who used to work in gospel land, they try to balance supply and demand by making 10, 20 year plans. What seems particularly ironic to me is companies and individuals who are otherwise full-fledged capitalists, when it comes to the context of spectrum policy, for some reason, forsake all their capitalist plans and, and theology and come to think that, that technology and services can be planned a decade in advance. Let me give you some basic laws of spectrum economics I observed in my 25 years at FCC. First thing, from the point of view of most people, free spectrum is always cheaper than efficient technology. Because efficient technology costs money, free spectrum doesn't. And if you got spectrum free, it stays free. Existing spectrum users generally have no incentive to accommodate new users or applications. If you want to understand what the ultra-wideband ultra battle is about, that's it. You have existing spectrum users, there's nothing in it for them for ultra-wideband. There might be a downside, but there certainly is no upside for them, and you can predict their behavior a lot from that. Thus, classic spectrum management policy is a battle between the haves and the have-nots. The haves generally control the 
national regulatory agencies, the Ofcoms of the world, and the have-nots don't. And what you see are battles between the haves and the have-nots. And nobody seems to care about GDP. Let me talk about FedEx. FedEx was started in 1975. FedEx was a late entrant into the world compared to railroads and other users of spectrum. And as a late entrant into the, into the world of spectrum use, they didn't have much access. Railroads had all sorts of access because they were big when spectrum was divided up. Trucking companies had all sorts of access. Poor little FedEx did. Why is that important? Well, FedEx badly needed a lot of spectrum, or not spectrum, a lot of mobile capacity. Nobody needs spectrum. You know, it's a lie when say, I need spectrum. Nobody needs spectrum. People need communication capacity, which is a function of both spectrum and technology. But FedEx had a desperate need for efficient dispatching for pickup and delivery because it was going in a new field and it couldn't get it. So they could have cried in their beer or they did something more productive. The FCC coincidentally around 19, at the same time FedEx was formed in the late 70s, opened the 700 megahertz band. That was sort of a digital dividend. The FCC decreased the number of TV channels in the 70s and made some of the former TV channels available for land mobile use, and it was made available under deregulation scheme with tremendous flexibility. Not total flexibility, but tremendous flexibility. But that deregulation allowed land mobile digital systems, and FedEx then teamed with, with IBM and developed a nationwide deployment of what today would be called a wireless PDA solution. It was sort of chunky compared to today's PDAs, but, it was, but the easiest way to describe the system that IBM implemented. Uh, and IBM wanted the system because at that time, you may, may remember mainframes, IBM had a large uh, repair force that used to go out and fix mainframes. So IBM had a need for, for mobile capacity. They implemented the system jointly, and there, that enabled FedEx to really get going. And when FedEx got going, FedEx then enabled whole other industries because, say, like one of the reasons why Land's End was successful and Gateway Computer and other companies in the United States is we had efficient nationwide delivery service uh, that was cost efficient and time efficient. Let me talk about simple technology. Simple technology was a pioneer in barcode scanners like we have in supermarkets, but they had the insight that a wireless handheld scanner would be very useful for warehouse and, and store inventory purposes. This is a niche application. If you go to an Ofcom, or an European counterpart and say, I need spectrum for warehouse barcode scanners. Most Ofcom-like agencies will tell you you're crazy. We're interested in the big picture. Nobody in regulatory agencies thinks about these obscure niche applications. And had they had to, to argue for that, they probably would have spent 10 years arguing before CEPT or FCC the need, the need for spectrum for this obscure application. But fortunately, the 85 spread spectrum decision, which, which turns out to be the same one that enabled Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, was flexible enough to allow this without any major policy decisions. And indeed, it turns out that the simple technology solution implementing the FCC spread spectrum rules was one of the antecedents of 802.11. 802.11 is a merger of that technology and a technology that started with NCR. But because there was deregulation, in this case in the license exempt area, this obscure niche application was able to get to market. It set the, it set the, ground, the, the grounds, the background for 80211. But more importantly, it turns out it revolutionized inventory control in both retail stores and warehouses, which had a GDP multiplier right there. They, the deregulation in this case allowed the use of new technology by FedEx and, and Symbol and, and had domino effect uh, economic follow-up. So when you do communications policy right, you get growth both in the telecommunications industry and in industries which are users of telecommunications. So that's the main point I'm trying to have here. And it, and it applies both to the licensed world and the unlicensed world. It's interesting, the US there's a major difference between 3G and Europe, with Europe. In Europe, if you get 3G spectrum, you have to use it for 3G. 
in the United States, you don't. So when we have an auction next month, uh, next month or two, you will see that the auction winners, maybe they'll do 3G, maybe they don't, but it's their choice, it's not the choice of the government economic planners. Um, <coughs> so that's basically all I have to say. I make that's my business. If you'd like to join the panel, then Bob can.